The New Orleans Saints down 21 players will take the field up against the Miami Dolphins tonight. We'll talk about what's going on, why this game is still being played. We'll take a look at the depth chart and we'll break down what the Saints can still do to compete and potentially win on Monday Night Football. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into this game day episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks as always for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day. Don't forget that we're free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube as well. And I am your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, Canal Street Chronicles, Locked On NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked On Saints. The New Orleans Saints are set to take on the Miami Dolphins on Monday Night Football tonight. We spent a good portion of last week getting to know Ian Book, the rookie from Notre Dame, who is expected to make his first start of his career tonight because Taysom Hill and Trevor Simeon are on the COVID reserve list, along with 19 other players and four coaches, including three assistant coaches and special teams coordinator Darren Rizzi. The New Orleans Saints are coming into this game and still have a chance to upset, surprise, and win. They enter this game now shifting from three-point favorites to three-point underdogs at home. Let's talk about how this happened. So as we've discussed, the New Orleans Saints are carrying 21 players on their COVID reserve list that will be unavailable for this game. The Saints currently have about 48 players that are on their active roster and practice squad, and they also enter with three players that are questionable Coming off of last week's injury report, those players include players like Marcus Davenport and Teron Armstead, who are big time for this game because particularly in on those trenches, there's not a lot of depth there. Some of the notable names that are on the COVID reserve list include, of course, Taysom Hill, as we discussed, but also linebackers Demario Davis and Quan Alexander, safety Malcolm Jenkins and special teams ace JT Gray. But you also see a lot of depth in the trenches on this list as well. So the Saints are going to have to be creative in terms of how they end up managing their the the snap counts, managing what it is that this team needs to do in order to be able to field an adequate enough roster to be able to compete today. I'm recording later on in the afternoon than I usually do because I wanted to make sure that I got the most recent and up to date information around who the New Orleans Saints are going to be fielding in this game because there are more players that could have gone on the list this morning players that could have come off the list today, and to an extent that can still happen. But at the time that I'm recording this Monday morning, no new names have been added since they added players like Malcolm Roach, Kavari Russell, Carl Granderson, and others on Sunday. So for the Saints, big places to watch here going into this game are going to be the trenches. Not only do you have Ryan Ramchek, who very was, I guess you could say, unlikely to play this week again anyway, considering that he hadn't practiced yet, but he was added to the COVID reserve list, so you know that he's out. But this team will also be without, say, Jordan Mills on the uh, offensive line, James Carpenter, who they've been using as a sixth offensive lineman. So there will be you know, some of those depth players that are out on a unit that is already relying on second, third string guys. Hopefully, Teron Armstead will be able to go tonight, which will allow James Hurst to move to right tackle and then uh, Calvin Throckmorton to stay at left guard. The Saints have been able to you know, pick up good yardage on the ground and protect the quarterback with that lineup. Big thing to watch will be Ian Book's depth of dropbacks in his first start and how that correlates with what Teron Armstead over on his blind side is expecting. Over on the defensive side, a big place where you're seeing them take a lot of hits right now are at the linebacker position. We mentioned uh, Demario Davis and Quan Alexander out. That's going to end up pushing guys like Pete Werner, Zach Bond, and Andrew Dowell into starting linebacker situations and starting linebacker responsibilities because you also have Cade Nellis, who's on this list as well. So when you look at all of the players that are named on the list, it's easy to get overwhelmed and it's easy to feel like, hey, there's no way that the New Orleans Saints can go in with 21 players on their COVID reserve list and be able to walk away with a victory. But that's not entirely true. Let's not forget that this is a team that pulled off the upset of the season last week by shutting out the Tampa Bay Buccaneers without a head coach, right? This is a team that's built from top to bottom to compete and this team will continue to compete. So that gets us to our Last topic here before we dive into the depth charts, 
why is this game still being played? You've got 21 players on the COVID reserve list, four coaches, including your special teams coordinator. We saw three games postponed last week. And now all of a sudden this game, as well as, uh, you know, a couple of other teams that were dealing with some major COVID issues over the course this week, their games not get pushed back either. The reason being is that the NFL doesn't want to push games back. Last week, we saw them postpone three and then immediately say that they don't plan to postpone any more games for the rest of the season. The NFL is very, very, let's just say, interested in protecting its monetary investment. (laughs) It's the best way that I can say that Um, in, in making sure that these games are happening on time and that fans who spent money on tickets don't get their, you know, have to either resell or they can't refund their ticket, things like that. So they want to keep their money as opposed to trying to move, you know, audiences, move uh, fans to different games on different nights and things like that. And then the sort of economic impact of what that means for the NFL begins to take hold as opposed to holding the game where it is. The NFL built back in November, uh, you know, in, in the CBA negotiations around this entire situation, which includes not only what the NFL proposed, but what the players voted for, uh, they built in an extra week uh, behind the Super Bowl as an opportunity to be able to push things back if they needed to. But there's pride here, there's finance here, and there's simply a lack of wherewithal and uh, attention to player safety, which we've seen consistently across the NFL. Like, you know, they do a lot of things where they talk about player safety, but, uh, you know, instead they focused on taunting this season. So, you know, one of the reasons why I haven't talked about it very much about this game not being moved is because first of all, I expected it, right? The NFL said last week, no games will be moved. No games will be postponed after they postponed those three games. So there would be no way, there would be no way that they would all of a sudden make an exception after saying that. They have a a tremendous amount of pride of finishing this season on time, which for some reason is more important than the health and safety of their players. Don't ask me why that is. I couldn't tell you. I just know that that's simply what we're seeing and that that's what we've seen exercise over the course of this season so far. And I, I, one of the reasons why I never talked about it or the the final reason why I never talked about it is because again, it's what I expected, right? And, And I think it's what we all expected is that once they said, that's it, we're not postponing any more games, there would be no exceptions to that or New Orleans certainly wouldn't be the exception to that. So this game is going to be played. And in playing this game, the New Orleans Saints have to find a way to compete if they want to keep their playoff hopes alive. They can lose this game to the Miami Dolphins and still have, you know, still make the playoffs at nine and eight. In fact, they can get into the sixth seed at nine and eight, depending upon if Seattle or excuse me, San Francisco loses to the Rams. And if if Philly loses to the Cowboys, then that helps the Saints a ton. That gets the Saints effectively into the seventh seed. If Philly loses two games, if they were to drop to, let's say, the Washington football team next week, then the Saints, if they win out beyond this week, which is likely, especially with the Carolina Panthers dealing with a situation that is sort of ongoing for them with their own COVID concerns, the Saints could even move into the sixth seed, if not the seventh seed by the end of the season at just nine and eight. So this game doesn't fully impact them, but you certainly want the win, and so do the New Orleans Saints. And if you listen to Ian Book's press conference on uh, Thursday, he mentioned that there's a lot of excuses, but they're not going to use any of them. So let's talk about that, right? Let's talk about what the New Orleans Saints are going to be able to field, what players are going to be at what positions, and what to expect from this team, and what they can do to win as we continue to break this down uh, ahead of the Monday night matchup tonight against the Miami Dolphins. We got that coming up for you and much more as we continue on with today's episode of Locked On Saints. But don't forget to check out our friends as well over at Built Bar or at Built.com, the best tasting protein bar on the market. You're talking about six or seven grams of sugar for a protein bar that includes flavors like cookies and cream, salted caramel, uh, peanut butter brownie, mint brownie. I mean, incredible flavors that taste like candy bars, but low in sugar, low in calories, low in carbs, high in fiber, and high in protein, 16, 17, 18 grams of protein in these bars. And they're covered in 100% chocolate, which makes that sugar count even more unbelievable, but you best believe it. You don't have to take my word for it. You can head over to built.com right now and try them out for yourself. You can grab a sample box, you can try a bunch of different flavors, or you can make your own and mix up to three flavors that you want to try as well. There are some fruit and chocolate flavors, as well as those big sweet sounding flavors, which are my absolute favorite. So go and check them out. It's built.com. Don't forget to use the promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, so you can get 15% off. That's 15% off with the promo code LOCKED15 at built.com. 
All right, here at Nation, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks, as always, for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day. Make sure that you're also checking out some of the big events we have going on here across the Locked on Podcast Network, including right now, the Ultimate College Football Playoff Preview 2021. You've got local experts, betting advice, and draft analysis, the most comprehensive college football playoff preview you're going to find, and it is live now. Just search Ultimate College Football Playoff Preview preview wherever you get your podcast. All right. So look, uh, the New Orleans Saints right now, 21 players on the COVID reserve list. We just talked about sort of the news and giving you a little bit of uh, what's going on. The Saints have dealt with a lot here. I mean, look, the they have Taysom Hill and Trevor Simeon that are both on there. Ian Book is going to be starting uh, tonight. Uh, the, the Saints went out and signed Blake Bortles. They reportedly even called guys like Drew Brees as well as Phillip Rivers to potentially make a one game comeback on Monday night. But those uh, didn't work out, although rumor has it that uh, uh, Drew Brees did go so far as to like test out his arm in the backyard before saying no. So he was at least a little bit interested. Right. But the Saints doing the things that they need to do in order to make sure that they can compete on Monday night. So it shows you that they're willing to, you know, try to pull players out of retirement in order to get to the point where they can compete in this game. So don't expect the New Orleans Saints, despite the fact that they're down 21 players, to lay down in this one. So let's talk about what the Saints will be able to field on offense and defense. We're going to get to special teams here in a little bit because I want to close out the show with that and we'll get an update on what's going on with the Panthers as well as that news continues to develop as well as any other updates that come along. But let's start with the offense here. We'll go offense and defense and what the Saints can do with this unit to remain competitive. Let's start with the offense first. Um, New Orleans Saints offensive line is going to look, uh, assuming no other names get added, right? And recording this early or not early, but you know, Monday afternoon uh, before the game. So we'll see if there's any other new names that come off or go on. But as of right now, the Saints offensive line won't really look that much different in terms of its starters before this game. Teron Armstead is currently questionable, but if he were to start, then you'd have Teron Armstead at left tackle, uh, 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 Calvin Throckmorton at left guard. Eric McCoy at center, Cesar Reese at right guard, and then James Hurst would bounce back over to right tackle. He played left tackle last week with Jordan Mills filling in at right tackle since the Saints were down both Teron Armstead and Ryan Ramchick. If Teron Armstead can't go, then expect James Hurst to bump over to left tackle again, and then Caleb Beninock to start over at right tackle. That would probably make sort of the six-man situation a little bit more complicated for New Orleans to be able to figure out who's going to be that guy. Uh, but otherwise, Caleb Beninock will likely be your sixth man when they come in with those heavy packages if they do that without Taysom Hill. Now, don't forget, Ian Book is a mobile quarterback, but he's not going to be your guy that you're going to run QB power with, right? So that's going to be your offensive line, assuming Toronto Armstead is healthy. If not, we talked about what that will look like as well. Now, let's talk about the weapons, the skill position players that are on the field. We know Ian Book is starting at quarterback tonight. That is for certain. So let's start with the tight ends here. You have both Adam Troutman and Juwan Johnson on the COVID-19 list, on that reserve list. Juwan Johnson was one of the earliest names to be uh, to, to, to go on the list, so he's one of those players that could potentially test out. Uh, we saw Tyreek Hill um, just before the Sunday game test out four days after being added to the list. Guys like Malcolm Jenkins, Juwan Johnson, even Taysom Hill, Trevor Simeon, they've all been on this list for four days now as well. So you, right now, you should expect, though, unless some of those players test out, Nick Vanette is going to be your guy, uh, your go-to tight end, and then you're going to see them also bring Ethan Wolf uh, into this one, either as a COVID replacement coming up from the practice squad or uh, as a standard elevation. So those are going to be your two tight ends. It's going to be a very Nick Vanette heavy day. He's a good blocker. He's a good pass catcher. He's caught you know eight passes on, on the season so far, and he's done probably more with the ball in his hands than we've seen Adam Troutman be able to do so far, if we're just being honest. And I you know, started my whole campaign for him to be tight end one for the rest of the season. So I feel pretty good with Nick Vanette being there. He spoke with media earlier on in the week and mentioned that a lot of guys are going to be asked to do things that they're not usually asked to do. So we'll see what that ends up looking like. And some of that might come down to the wide receivers. Uh, your top three wide receivers in this one are probably going to be Marquez Callaway, Traquan Smith, and then I imagine Lil Jordan Humphrey, who doesn't have a ton of catches on the season, but has, again, done more with the ball in his hands than some of the other options. Kenny Stills, Kevin White. We might see Kawan Baker finally active in this game just out of necessity. Like the Saints may only have the amount of players that they need to be able to play the game anyway with 48 active. So that could lead to guys like Kawan Baker being active for the first time this season. We'll see if that actually transitions into or translates, excuse me, into any playing time. Uh, and then you'll have Alvin Kamara, uh, Mark Ingram. Your, your running back room hasn't been really impacted so far, fingers crossed. Um, Alvin Kamara, Mark Ingram, 
Uh, Ty Montgomery will all probably get snaps there. Adam Prentice probably be your your lead fullback. Get in there and, and, and execute some lead blocks as well. So what is it the New Orleans Saints need to do on the offensive side in order to be successful? Well, they have to do this offense has to be predicated by the run game. This offense should go through Alvin Kamara. It's going to be tough for Miami to be able to keep up with Alvin Kamara if he's on the way that we have seen him before. One of the reasons why you hope to have Teron Armstead back is because of how impactful Teron Armstead is to Alvin Kamara's running game. So a run game is going to be a big one that leads you to be able to utilize things effectively like uh, play actions, like uh, boot actions, uh, 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 rollouts, things like that. So look for them to keep Ian Book mobile and active in this one, moving him off the line, moving the line of scrimmage, all of that, or excuse me, moving the uh, offensive line, all of that. And then a quick passing game, right? We finally saw like the quick slant to um, uh, Marquez Callaway last week. Would love to see more of that with Ian Book. You can utilize Traquan Smith pretty successfully off of the line of scrimmage, pretty close to the line of scrimmage. Aesop Winston in the screen game, uh, Lil Jordan Humphrey over the middle, Nick Vanette over the middle as well. So look for a little bit more of a focus on a quick passing game in addition to condensing the offense a little bit to operate in the short and intermediate area, but then take some shots every now and then, right? Like don't, don't limit yourself because of the players that you have, right? Find a way to, or the players that you don't have, find a way with the players that you do have on the field to still be able to impact the game. Expecting in book to have some rookie mistakes in this one, but if they can still run through the run game or operate through the run game and utilize sort of those mobile quarterback necessities, those mobile quarterback staples like rollouts, um, quick, quick slants, quick screens, those types of things that you look for in a young quarterback, but also in a mobile quarterback, then they should be able to move the ball. And if they can move the ball and get field goals, we've seen what they're able to do over on the defensive side, but the defense is going to kind of be changed up a little bit too. And there's two particular positions on the Miami Dolphins offense that may be concerned about the New Orleans Saints defense. So let's jump to that real quick before we get to special teams to wrap up the show. The defensive line so far unchanged in terms of its starters. Marcus Davenport, who's currently questionable, we'll see if he's able to go. That's certainly the hope is that he'll be able to get out on the field operating opposite Cam Jordan who had a great game last week. want to see him be able to continue that. Remember that Cam Jordan is also on Tua's blind side in this one as well with a left-handed quarterback. Shy Tuttle, David Onyemata, and the interior. Cam Jordan and Marcus Adamport are effectively your two um, uh, defensive ends in this one. So expect maybe to see, you know, Zach Bond utilized as a pass rusher and all of that. But Zach Bond might have a busy day, all told, because you're down, you're starting two linebackers in this one. Demario Davis and Quan Alexander, probably outside of quarterback, the most decimated in terms of starting uh, talent on the team on this list. So that means that Pete Werner should probably be your signal caller, right? They kind of see him as the middle linebacker, the Mike of the future, if they can you know, continue to build him into that. And so with that, expect Pete Werner to be the guy calling the shots on defense. And then you have uh, some kind of a split between Andrew Dowell and Zach Bond, I imagine, next to him. Now, they tried to use Zach Bond as a coverage linebacker, as an off-ball linebacker week two when Pete Werner was hurt. Did not go well at all, uh, at least early. He got better late in the game, but he was also matched up with Christian McCaffrey. So how much do you really put stock in that when you come into this game where he's going to be matched up with like Duke Johnson, right? So with that being the case, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Zach Bond get some opportunities as the other coverage linebacker in this one next to Pete Werner, especially because Andrew Dowell is one of your core special teamers. Although Zach Bond plays a big role in special teams for you as well. Up at the safety position, you've still got Marcus Williams at the corners. You've still got Mar um, Marshawn Lattimore, CJ Garner-Johnson, and Paulson Adebo. Big thing is going to be that you're going to be without Malcolm Jenkins, who's one of your veteran leaders. So you're down two big-time veteran leaders and two other Ironmen, right? You had Cam Jordan miss the first game of his career just two weeks ago. Now you're looking at Demario Davis and uh, Malcolm Jenkins about to break potentially their streaks as well, depending upon if they're able to uh, test out before this game, which seems unlikely. And so with that being the case, with Malcolm Jenkins out, PJ Williams is probably your other deep safety next to Marcus Williams. You got the Williams brothers. There aren't actually brothers. Uh, and, you know, look, they like PJ Williams as a safety, right? They, they've utilized him there as a, a, a quite a bit. If they wanted to bring him down to play in the box because of his experience playing as a slot corner and run support, he's going to be fine in the box, just like you utilize with uh, Marcus Williams. But what concerns me right now is the middle of this defense, which are the linebackers, tight ends, as well as running backs. Good news is that you're probably going to see a lot of zone coverage here, which means Tua Tungavailoa's rushing ability, you get your eyes on him in, in coverage, right? But tight ends, running backs over the middle of the field in the passing game, definitely something to watch in this one, as well as the crossing patterns, which killed the Saints earlier. They've done better over the course of the last few games is that defense is really um, solidified over the middle. But now you're talking about Tua, who they like to roll out and they like to 
have these receivers cross the field and go to where he's going. The play flow goes and brings receivers across the field. How much trouble is that potentially going to give the Saints defense? Something that is already built in to Miami's offense. And then CJ Garner Johnson, he will probably help out in the middle. You could potentially move him up to where Malcolm Jenkins is and have him play safety and then use either Bradley Roby or PJ Williams in the slot. But I could see them using PJ Williams deep and then just creating a rotation in the slot between CJ Gardner Johnson as well as uh, Bradley Roby. But I think you want CJ Gardner Johnson closer to the line of scrimmage so that he can help out in the middle of the field, cover some of those tight ends, cover some of those running backs out the backfield as well. At least that's my instinct. We'll see how the New Orleans Saints actually uh, approach this. All right, y'all, coming up next, we're going to talk special teams, which is a, a, a space that has taken a big hit, but I'm not as concerned about it as we sort of break this all down in terms of who's out, but who's coming up as well. So we'll talk about special teams and get you updated on everything going on with the Saints and Panthers game next week as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Before we get there, though, betonline.ag, fastest and easiest place to place all of your bets. They finally put the line back up for the Saints and Panthers game. The Saints were originally favored minus three at home, 38 over under, one of the lowest for the New Orleans Saints over the course of the last 15 years. The over under has now dropped to 37 and a half, so it got even lower. And the New Orleans Saints are now underdogs at home plus three. So Miami's getting three points in this one. And that has a lot to do with the changes that you have seen in terms of quarterbacks and and everything going on. So if you like that line, you like the Saints as home underdogs, I certainly do. It's going to be a blackout at the Dome. The the, the crowd is going to show up. The Houdet Nation is going to show up and be very supportive of this team. So if you like that minus three or that plus three for New Orleans, if you like New Orleans in this game, betonline.ag is the best place to go to place that bet. And if you haven't been there before, I'm going to help you out a little bit. Make sure you use the promo code locked on L O C K E D O N. So you get a 50% welcome bonus. That's a 50% welcome bonus on all of the betting that you want to do, not just for the saints, but NFL, NBA, everything around the world of sports over at bet online, your online sports book experts. Let's get it. Houdet Nation wrapping up this game day episode of locked on saints here. Talked about the new Orleans saints and the Miami dolphins matching up in uh, this Monday night football game tonight. Uh, Again, we're we're releasing the show a little bit late today because I wanted to make sure that I got you the most up-to-date information. And thankfully, we did that because we're learning a little bit about what's going on with the New Orleans Saints and Carolina Panthers game next week on the second. But let's focus real quick on special teams because I just kind of want to talk through this. Talk about the offense, how it's been impacted, the defense, how it's been impacted. Now let's talk about the third element of the game that the New Orleans Saints care very much about. Now they're key specialists, guys like Blake Gilligan, as well as Brett Maher, as well as uh, Zach Wood. They are all fine, right? Those core guys are are good. But now you look at some of the names on the COVID reserve list, JT Gray, Dwayne Washington, Caden Ellis, Jeff Heath, Kavari Russell is somebody that could have stepped into that role. Those are all core special teamers or people that could have been impactful in place of those core special teamers. So those guys are all out. So what do the New Orleans Saints have when it comes to their special teams unit? So some of the key names to watch in this game. Ken Crawley, Andrew Dowell, Ty Montgomery. Those three are big. Um, Ken Crawley has been a very good special teamer his entire career, even when he was a even when he was a starting corner for the Saints back in 2017. Uh, he was a core special teamer for them, and he's been very good as a special teamer. So you'll see uh, Ken Crawley elevated and, and and ready to go for this one, or, or getting more playing time on special teams. Andrew Dowell has been a core special teamer for the Saints all season. Thankfully, he's still available as I record this. Ty Montgomery, same thing. Zach Bond, same thing. So those guys are going to be your core guys that are going to be getting down the field, making tackles in terms of kickoffs as well as punt coverage. The other guys that can step up in this one are going to be players like defensive back Dylan Mabin, which the Saints just recently brought in uh, just over the course of this last week or so. He was formerly with the Minnesota Vikings, very good special teamer, 6-1 DB, uh, can fly. Uh, PJ Williams has since it's kind of slowed down in terms of his special teams um, ability or not ability, but special teams usage has kind of slowed down for PJ Williams as his role has grown over on the defense, but he could be somebody that steps in to special teams. And it's, it's a little jarring to consider that because he's also going to be getting probably meaningful defensive snaps in this one as well at safety or in the slot. And so you worry the risk of losing him by having him play those special team snaps. But at this point you can't be picky, right? Another player to watch is going to be undrafted rookie out of Tennessee, another Tennessee volunteer expected to hit the hit the uh, field for the New Orleans Saints in this one, Bryce Thompson. Um, 
safety. He can fly. He's a big hitter as well. So look out for Bryce Thompson to potentially be somebody to contribute in special teams. The big thing is going to be, can the Saints still produce on special teams as consistently and as well as they do without Darren Rizzi there? It helps that you've got head coach Sean Payton back, but that's definitely something to watch here because their special teams coordinator is also out for this game and will not be on the sideline. But those are some of the core special teamers to watch in this one to help make up for guys like JT Gray, Dwayne Washington, Caden Ellis, and Jeff Heath, who you've lost to the COVID-19 list at this time. Um, All right, let's take a look ahead for next week because this is a big thing. You don't want to look ahead of the game tonight, right? Winning this game up against Miami Dolphins certainly helps the New Orleans Saints. It doesn't, it doesn't really hurt them because it's an AFC opponent. It just hurts them because their record doesn't get better, which could be a deciding factor later on. But in terms of tiebreakers and things like that, losing to an AFC opponent, not a big deal. Uh, and the Saints, if they win out, will have a better conference record in the NFC than the 49ers. So if they ended up tied, the Saints would actually win that tiebreaker since they didn't play head to head. And then Philly is kind of the the tricky one there because Philly has a head to head win over New Orleans. So looking ahead here after this game up against Monday up, up against the Dolphins on Monday night, the Saints and Panthers game was moved to a national audience 325 Central Time on January 2nd. Soon after that, Carolina has been dealing with what uh, Matt Rule, head coach for the Carolina Panthers, uh, referred to as a uh, as a considerable amount, right? of players that tested positive uh, this this after this weekend's games. So now they're dealing with their own issues in terms of availability going into this one. Brian Burns was the first name that was added to the list, but there have since been more uh, names that have released. Let me grab those so I make sure I get you the most up-to-date stuff here. So some of the names that have been added include Shaq Thompson along with Brian Burns, uh, Marquise Haynes, so the defensive line taking a big hit here, Phil Haskins, uh, Davion Nixon, all also defensive linemen, and then Matt Paratus, their starting center, also added to the list. Now, Nixon and uh, Paratus were already on injured reserve, but you could see the defensive line starting to take a hit there. And as we've seen with the New Orleans Saints, it might start with a few names, but it could potentially expand to more. So something to keep an eye out on for New Orleans, because you hate to see this happen and you hope that everybody is healthy and everybody is okay. But the Carolina Panthers are already eliminated. Now they're dealing with this. They don't have an offensive coordinator, right? The offensive coordinator they started the season with. So the, the road gets a little bit easier for the New Orleans Saints after this game because a lot of these players should be back for New Orleans, at least, before they take on the Carolina Panthers. Carolina could potentially be shorthanded in dealing with everything that they're already dealing with as well. So the road to the playoffs is still very much alive for the New Orleans Saints, regardless of what happens here against the Miami Dolphins. But if New Orleans can walk away with a win, with an effective run game, a good quick passing game, keeping Ian Book mobile, keeping him comfortable doing what it is that they like. If they can limit the damage that you know, Miami does with their running backs out of the backfield in the passing game, as well as the tight ends, if they can shore up the middle of the field and keep their defensive line fresh and effective, then they could potentially still walk away with a win. Then the conversation that we'll be having is what is the most impressive win that the New Orleans Saints have had this season? Being able to win without 21 players or being able to win without your head coach and several players? Because remember, we're only counting 21 players on the COVID reserve list. We're not counting all the players that are also on injured reserve like Peyton Turner, Michael Thomas, who's never been able to make it back, Will Lutz, who they had to sort of fight to replace all throughout the season. The New Orleans Saints, they continue to impress in terms of what it is that they're able to do in the face of adversity. Here's another opportunity and perhaps one of their uh, most challenging yet to be able to come out here and shock the world yet again. So let's see if they can do it. Uh, Tomorrow, we'll be back with more on Tuesday, either a victory Tuesday or We'll talk about a little bit of a misery Tuesday, although I'm not going to feel bad about this team if they end up losing. I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to come in here if they end up losing this game against Miami, doom and gloom, because the playoff hopes are still alive and this team is in an understandable situation, but they're going to compete. They're going to compete. And that's what our focus is going to be on as we continue on all throughout the week here on Locked on Saints. Thanks as always for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day. For your second listen, make sure you go and check out Locked on Bets. Win yourself some money this week with your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. Replace some of that holiday spending that you just did uh, with the good guys over at Locked on Bets. As always, y'all, for everything in between these episodes on your New Orleans Saints, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them can trust you that nation. I'll holla at you.